Oh, hey. I'm just chilling. No big deal. You know, I'm feeling pretty good right now. No stress, no work, no Ninja Gaiden tree. Let's get this over with. Ninja Gaiden 3 is the final installment in the Ninja Gaiden trilogy for the NES. For the NES. I'm never escaping this stupid franchise. Of course, this is the same side-scrolling platformer developed and published by Tech. It was released in Japan on June 26, 1991 for the Famicom and in North America in August for the NES. However, the NES version was never released in Europe. As much as I hate how Nintendo keeps restricting most of its products to Europe, I'm glad this is one of them. No one should ever suffer playing this game. Only people that don't have a living can play this game like me. But it did get a port later on to the Atari Lynx, a handheld by Atari. It was released in 1993 in Europe and in North America, with the European version retaining the North American title. So this is interesting. So the North American titles, obviously, have Ninja Gaiden as the title for the series. In Europe, however, the first two Ninja Gaiden games are called Shadow Warriors. Now, in the third entry, they decide to keep the same name for both North America and Europe. Why? I usually don't like changing titles to localized games for other regions, so if you're going to change the title for a third entry of a series that already has its own established name in a specific region, why even bother? That's like changing Avengers Infinity Ward into a Defender's Eternal Battle or something. Now, while we're on the topic of titles, let's take a look at the box art. I don't like this. Let's compare the three box arts. The first one is alright, it's got a lot of tension going on in the background, and there's a lot of fire, which could imply that the game's telling you that what you're going to play is the literal definition of hell. The second I think looks much better. You got more story elements on the cover, and it is overall pretty solid. This is just bland and empty. You only got Ryu on the cover and that's it. I mean, it's fine, it's serviceable. It's just that compared to the last two games, this is definitely the worst one. There aren't any story elements or anything that's happening in the background. I guess the cloud there represents the ancient ship of doom, but if it is, it doesn't even look close to the one we see in-game. And we'll get there in a few moments because I got one more thing to whine about. It said in Wikipedia, the best place for all your sources, that the North American version, which is the one that I played, was intentionally made harder than the Japanese version by the use of limited continues, stronger enemies, and the removal of a password system, which could have been so useful because while the game isn't too long, it's very hard. I mean, why? Why specifically the North American version? Why not do the same with the European version or even the Japanese version? What did the land of obesity do to deserve this? And why am I angry about this? I'm not even an American. Alright, this is it. Even though this is just the first of the many other games of Ninja Gaiden. Why am I being sentimental? I hate Ninja Gaiden. So we boot up the game and the cutscene plays, much like the previous two games. We see Irene getting chased by us, so this is what happens when you're a Minecraft YouTuber. Evil dialogue, Irene falls off cliff and dies. But that's just a theory. A game theory. We received the news and we headed to the laboratory where Irene was being chased, then the game starts. So, who's ready for me to lose it? So this is the first level. I hope you like industrial piping. We're inside the laboratory, and what the hell are these? So we got ninjas, obviously, and some robotic spiders. Apparently, they also got a mummy wearing a turtle shell for a hat and a floating marshmallow. One new feature you may have noticed already is the ability to hang overhead from surfaces. This is a really cool mechanic that should have been implemented more often today in platforming games. This ability is pretty useful whenever you're in a tight situation when you're surrounded by enemies. Doing this will give you just a bit amount of time to decide how to get out of situations like that. The problem is, is that in the later part of the game, most of the enemies fly out of nowhere and you're always guaranteed to get hit. Of course, the power-ups return. We get the same power-ups from the previous games, the boomerangs, the fireballs, and the fire wheel. But we get a new power-up that allows you to throw projectiles above and below you simultaneously. This power-up is really useful to me in the last few levels of the game, especially since most enemies come above and below you. One thing I notice is that more health potions pop up, especially the 1-ups, though they are more difficult to get by. Moving back to the first level, it's pretty easy in Ninja Gaiden terms. There are some parts where there are a ton of enemies, but overall it's not a very difficult first level. 
and then we make it to the boss. Again, it's not that challenging. You just gotta time the attacks properly and when to dodge. But if you do get hit, you'll lose a ton of health, so be careful. And that's the first boss, easy. What do you mean this isn't an ordinary lab? They got Scyther and Baymax on crack. We then are greeted by a guy that's totally not creepy at all. He tells us to go to the Castle Rock Fortress. To get there, we'll have to get past all the traps our enemy has set up for us. When did they never? Alright, it's Act 2 and... No! It's a tradition to hate sand levels in video games. If you don't follow this tradition, are you even a gamer? So there are these areas that have quicksand and you slowly sink in if you stand still for a few seconds. All you have to do is to just jump around, but of course, it's Ninja Gaiden. And what do they have in store for us? Mummies with a watermelon for a head and alien frogs. I swear these frogs are so annoying. I jump and try to hit them, I get hit first. I crouch and try to hit them once they land, same thing. I stand still and try to hit them, the same thing happens again, and they drain your health bar if you don't kill them, I swear. These guys are probably one of the worst enemies throughout the entire series in the NES. And that's not all. There are these flying enemies that slowly get to you. While they're slow, they take up most of the space you're trying to get to, but compared to the frogs, these enemies are easier to kill since they move slowly. And also, what happened? It'd be nice if you put a pyramid there since the next stage takes place indoors, but no. You move to the right, next stage. There is no smooth transition here like, like some parts in the game. Anyway, here's the next stage. We're somewhere on the ground and are introduced to this enemy. This guy has a shield so you have to wait for them to attack so that they're vulnerable. This part of the level is the first one with tight spacing. There's always at least one enemy on a platform that you're trying to get to. We then enter this part where we run away from the lava. I really like this part. I still have to use save states here, but it's still far from difficult, though it's easy to mess up here. With the way Ninja Gaiden platforming works, it doesn't feel too slow or too fast. It just gives you enough time to take out enemies as you try to escape from the lava. But then again, it's easy to mess up here. We escape the lava and these things return from the second game. Great. Other than that, not much new stuff in this part, then we get to the second box. The boss flies around which is annoying and it flies up and down whenever it launches an attack. It does this upside down v-shaped attack which can be hard to dodge but all you need to do is to stay away from the boss's projectile range whenever it stops. The fight gets more frustrating if you use up your ninja meter to use your secondary weapons. Even if your ninja meter is full, the fight takes a lot of time to finish and it's easy to mess up here. But overall it's not the hardest boss fight so moving on. Cutscene place and Foster. Oh, that guy from the first game. Where have you been? Why weren't you in the second game? And why do you have a red background? Oh. Alright, now we're in the spawn. How do we get from there to here? Anyway, this level incorporates a ton of platforming that requires you to hang under them. Ignore that. There are these platforms that float up and down and the majority of them float too down that you can instantly die from the water. What is the point of this? And there are these fish that just jump around. They're about as annoying as the frogs from the last level. The good thing is that they only appear at this level. The bad thing is they're everywhere here in this level. And then there are times when you have to hang over a vine to avoid an enemy. But there's always that one enemy that stays above the vine and when you hang over it, you have no choice but to take damage. But this doesn't happen only in this level, it also happens in the following levels too. Just like, why? The enemy just touched my hand, how did it hurt me? So we enter in a, uh, where the hell am I? Like the previous games, the water pushes you here as well. Not much of a big problem, but can be a bit irritating in tight scenarios. There are also these spike balls that appear from above. They basically just follow you around and they can be pretty hard to dodge, but there's always a trusty wall by your side. We also have these blobs that show projectiles that occur from both sides. Again, these projectiles aren't the hardest to dodge and they take time to charge. So this entire area is a bit long and contains a ton of enemies and all you have to do is to head to the very bottom. At the bottom, we have these frogs, though they don't move as fast as the ones in the last level. Other than that, I feel like they only appeared on this one level, so who cares about them. Next up, we have a lot of shit to tackle here. So let me show an image of this part of the level to summarize what you'll be dealing with here. Can you tell me what I had to go through? This is the first part that I spent a lot of time trying to get through. 
Even with save states, this stage is just dreadful because these things return all the time. From the first game, we have these birds. They're annoying, small, and they hit me most of the time and you can't even hit them. The same applies here, though this time they're bigger and they take up way too much space. And whenever I feel like I hit them first, I get hit first. This right here is the worst enemy in video game history yet. After that terror, we are greeted by the third boss of the game. Wait, let me just rephrase that. We are greeted by the third bosses of the game. They really like frogs. So we have to deal with these two frogs which apparently share the same health bar, which is good, but man is it hard to dodge them. The shurikens that they throw at you are nearly impossible to dodge. And shortly after that, they jump around and you'll never know where they're going to land. Like the previous boss fight, this takes a while to finish. Primarily because the frogs move everywhere so fast that you don't even have enough time to deal some damage. This is the first boss fight I struggled with in this game, and it took me like 12 minutes. That doesn't sound a lot, but given that you take a ton of damage by just a single hit, 12 minutes is a long time. After that, another cutscene plays, this time we met our clone, so we get a fight scene while the protagonist and the antagonist talk to each other. Typical anime stuff, but at least this one has a lot less stuff going on on screen so that there's time to read the subtitles. Unlike some animes, the fight begins, we lost. You're nothing but talk, aren't you? What do you mean, I'm you? I'll use the information from this fight the next time we meet. Okay, nerd, I got safe states. So we're, uh... Are we underground or at the top? Is that Baba in the background? Why are those mountains upside down? Where am I? Not much new stuff here. There are some parts where you need to time with the moving platforms. And this is where it kinda gets annoying. Remember those slow flying enemies from the second level? Well, this is where they truly become the third annoying enemy of the game. When trying to get to this platform, you have no choice but to lose health getting there unless you got the new power up. But they spawn at a specific place depending on where you are. So you can just ignore some of them since they move slowly, but then again they take up a lot of space and you can get pretty hard to dodge them in a tight spot. But that's not all. We also got the flying bees. Same thing, but it's more annoying trying to hit them. Then we get inside the dungeon with spikes appearing and disappearing at a given time. They're easy to dodge in the first few stages, but they deal a ton of damage. There are these things that shoot projectiles in three different directions. Pretty easy to dodge, but it takes a while trying to hit them. So don't even bother doing that. There's a lot more important stuff than these things. Overall, there's not much stuff in this part. You just gotta time your jumps, and there are times when enemies are in places where you can't hit normally, so you have to use some power-ups to beat them. Then we move to this section. Ever imagine what a Violet Galaga ship looks like? Here you go. They're pretty easy to kill using the right power-ups, but if you don't have any, you screwed up. These enemies move horizontally, either from the left or from the right, and they mostly move very slowly and move pretty fast when they like to. Just like the previous part, you just gonna time when you move and jump. The next part is pretty much the same. And then we get to the fourth boss. We're fighting Chestnut. So what does he do? Well, he walks towards you, drills underground, and throws fire at you. There's something funny about him going underground. The range of his fire attack is insane. It attacks 5 times and immediately after that, he jumps at you. But this guy is not the hardest boss. It's not that difficult to dodge a fire attack most of the time since you know that it's aiming at you. This fight is probably my favorite out of all the boss fights of the entire game or maybe even the entire series in the NES. Mainly because it's not the most difficult and for me it's probably the only boss fight that I had fun playing through. Ew. I knew you'd come. Yuck. I remember you. I don't. Who the hell is Clancy? So Clancy tells us that he used to work for Foster and that he's secretly creating a Bionoid. To which we ask, what's a Bionoid? And he answered this, good luck winning at who wants to be a millionaire. So Foster was rebuilding the fortress and doing some experiments. He's doing some evil stuff basically. Cool cutscene. So we arrive at Castle Rock Fortress, i.e. the late 1700s. We got these robots that shoot projectiles by an arc. The attacks area is a bit wide but it's pretty easy to dodge them. But oh my god, so many bees, so many spider thingies, so many drones, there's so many. Right now, where are we? We got this guy that shoots the slowest laser beam in video game history. There's no way to deflect this attack, so you gotta crouch down. The problem here is if there are a bunch of enemies coming towards you and you crouch under the beam, you cannot move while crouching, so you're pretty much vulnerable when this happens. 
the moment you see this enemy pop up, try your best to kill him quickly. And this is something you want to do when you move to this part. There are a ton of enemies here, mostly the said enemies and those little things that jump around in this area. I recommend killing those guys first since if they shoot, you can't move around much. So just do that. Now we encounter Foster when Irene shows up. What? Our evil clone shows up, does a Dragon Ball Z move, and transform into an evil purple Hulk. And this is by far the hardest boss fight yet. The boss jumps around, throws shurikens, and throws fireballs nearly at the same time. You're gonna spend a lot of time in this boss fight, and it's going to be more devastating when you realize you've spent so much time just trying to get to the boss fight. So when you run out of time, you go back here. The key to this boss fight is patience. Since the boss jumps around so much, you can't hit him most of the time. And he attacks often, so you need to be quick to dodge him. There's not much else to say here, it's just the fight takes so long to beat. So Clancy arrives, and what do you know, he's the real bad guy. He brought Foster with him and teleported to another dimension, I guess. So we followed him, and we entered this crystal cave. The platforms act like the ice from the previous game, so no explanation is needed here. And then... Am I in a mukbang video? So you might think that these are walls, well, they aren't. They just appear in the foreground, like why even put them here? You can't even discern it from the platforms around you. Honestly, they're pretty worthless. There's no reason to put them here. You're supposed to be dead. Who's that? Is that Goro from Mortal Kombat? Oh no, it's Scorpion. So this is a pretty simple fight. He shoots a fireball, charges at you, hits the wall, and stuff comes down. Overall, not a pretty difficult boss fight, so moving on. We got teleported and we meet Clancy, who now looks like Admiral Thrawn. What happened? The ancient ship of doom is summoned, and now we gotta stop it. We're playing Wing Fortress Zone in reverse, and God damn, we got air again. It's still pretty annoying, like the last title. Then we entered this area. Not much new in this area other than these electric fences that could literally kill you. Once we move to this part, I'm embarrassed to say how many times I tried this part. It's just that these moving platforms move so fast and the electric fences here provide you barely any space to jump around, so you just gotta time your moves properly. And then we enter this area which is pretty long and pretty challenging, so moving on. Spikes, fuck shit fuck more spikes. Then we finally encounter Clancy one last time who looks like a Gundam that tried to fuse with an insect. He convinces us to join him and since we're the good guy we refused obviously. Now, this fight ain't the hardest. You can do a ton of damage if you use your power-ups at the start of the fight to immediately, but eventually you lose energy to use them. So when you try to hit him normally with a katana, you hit him and you hit him once more because he'll stop moving when you hit him for the first time. Just try to dodge the projectiles, especially the lightning. Overall, not the hardest fight, but of course, this isn't the last boss fight. The second phase isn't too difficult as well. A bunch of projectiles come at the boss and charge up an attack that tracks you. This is his only attack here which makes this phase pretty easy. And then we make it to the final phase which acts like the same final phase from the previous games. He shoots a curved projectile and another projectile that bounces around. Sometimes this curved projectile is in the ground. I guess the attack depends on where you are vertically. There's barely any room here, so like that one boss from earlier, this fight will take you a while to beat. So once you hit him enough times, you just gotta hit the orb in his chest. And now he attacks sort of in a V-shaped pattern where he shoots lasers at you, and after just barely making it out alive, we beat the game. Yes! Finally! I've beaten the entire trilogy. That means I can rest. Well, no, we still got a couple minutes left. So there goes the entire Ninja Gaiden trilogy for the NES. Definitely one of the best series of games for the system. It's full of action, has a good story, and looks pretty good for an NES game. However, it has its downsides. Obviously, these games are difficult, but not as much. Those who are new to these games might beat these games, and some might even find fun in these games. Pretty sure they belonged in a isolation ward. The gameplay is unique. It's just a perfect combination of being fast enough for the modern gaming audience, but with just the right amount of clunkiness to make it feel like an NES game. The entire story of this series is nothing groundbreaking. Did you really expect this game to have a LEGO Marvel Super Heroes level of story quality? 
these games are from the 80s. It's not bad, but it's serviceable enough, and it's pretty much what you'd expect out of a video game about ninjas in the 1980s. As basic as the story is, it's actually quite good. Now, do I recommend playing these games? What have I been complaining about for 3 episodes? Nah, it's just that you can either tolerate these games or not. Just depends on you and your personality if you want to play the game. The only reason why I've been talking about games like this is to let everyone know that these kinds of games are the embodiment of suffering, but there's still good in them which justifies the reason to want to play these games, and Ninja Gaiden is one of the many examples of that. I think I see it now. Even if my entire existence is based on complaining about stupidly difficult games, they're not actually that terrible. They're just terribly hard, but that's one of the reasons why they're good, and as you may already know, I reviewed the entirety of Ninja Gaiden, and it's good. It's pretty good. It's just hard. And by the entirety of Ninja Gaiden, I mean a third of the entire franchise.